Hello everyone, my name is Anila. I work as a senior software engineer at Red Hat. Uh, and this is Andrea. We met, we work on totally different uh, products at Red Hat. And we met via LinkUp. It's an internal tool we use for networking. And we decided we'll present here. Yeah, we just bonded over Spy-Fi topics and we never expected they will actually accept it. But here we are standing four months later. Uh, so please use the Slido even for the newcomers. We have two polls there and we can't afford to wait for your answers while we are showing the slide. Um, and I guess let's, let's start. Uh, so you are right after lunch. We are expecting your excitement at this level. It's the outline of the presentation. Um, and by the end of the presentation, it, was, it, it should reach uh, almost 100%. Uh, we are hoping it, you will enjoy it. We'll start with some intro and some facts. Uh, we will give you some background. Uh, since we are software engineers, we are not uh, neuroscientists. It will be from our perspective. So don't expect any deep dive in, into neuroscience. Uh, then we will tell you what's the current research, something about uh, what's happening right now and what's interesting. Uh, I'm sure everyone heard about Neuralink, so we won't mention it that much. We will mention other research. Uh, we will tell you what is possible, but mostly it will be about what is not possible. Uh, uh, then, of course, we have to mention ethics, uh, because there are some important questions we have to answer. Or probably we just ask you the questions and you will leave with more questions than answers. Uh, then we will have some with some numbers, uh, with the storage section. Uh, and, of course, we will end it with something that's really hopeful for the future, uh, impact on the environment. And then we'll, we'll tell you something about advantages, if there are any. Uh, all right, uh, thank you for filling out the, the slides. Uh, it definitely fits the future world. Um, future sci-fi, yeah, Blade Runner, sure. Hopefully we will not end up like in Blade Runner. Um, <laughs> um, I think we will touch the topic of movies and series. Um, you can actually follow the slides, we attach them to the, to the schedule. So for some reason, if you want to double check the, the slides, you can, you can do it there. All right, I think, I think we can continue. Uh, this is basically the, the funny background where it all started. It started in 1955 with the short story that was published in, uh, in uh, Galaxy Science Fiction magazine. It's called The Tunnel Under the World. And I will tell you the plot twist, so spoiler alert. Uh, yeah, by your ears, you're right. And, <laughs> uh, and it's the story about how uh, some guy wakes up one day and he discovers that, uh, or two of the time, Throughout the story, he discovers that a uh, chemical plant in his city exploded, he's dead, and his brain was, uh, was uploaded to a miniatur miniaturized robot. And all, he and all of the city is miniaturized, and every night they reset their brains, and they are testing marketing strategies on them. Every different marketing strategy on every day. Uh, so that's where it all started. You, of course, know, as we saw in the previous slide, you know other, other shows. If you are not from Czech Republic, uh, you can check out the Restore Point movie. It's our local movie. I will leave up to you uh, to give the ratings on it. Uh, we are not most known for sci-fi movies here. Um, yeah, so this is this was the start. And now, um, since we are thinking about storing human mind digitally, we have to at least tell you how our brain does it. And then we can start thinking about how would you do it in digital world. Uh, so it starts with some sensory input. Uh, that's something you absorb through your senses. It can, you can taste it, smell it, hear it. Uh, I'm not smelling anyone's lunch, so that's, it's easier for me to present here right now. But, <laughs> uh, but it would start with sensory input. That would, then your brain would start processing the information. It would transform it to electrical and chemical signals. And sometimes, uh, some, somehow, the information would get encoded into your brain. It wouldn't be stored uh, at one place because you have complex neural network inside your brain. So your brain basically does backups for you. It gets stored in multiple places and if you forget the stuff, you are able to recall it again. Um, then you have, of course, the storage. Uh, then you, if you would um, compare it to Neuralink, which I'm sure, like, raise your hands if you don't know Neuralink. Sure, like, okay. Uh, so a uh, neural link is the brain-computer uh, interface, which basically is uh, implanted into your brain, and uh, it uh, collects the signals from your brain, then transmits it to inter to external device, and the external device somehow uh, makes sense what's happening. It can move your prosthetic arm or cursor on your on your screen. 
so it's similar as your brain would do it, but it's, this is happening inside your brain and the neural link does it externally in, uh, in some external device. Uh, but with Neuralink, you can't actually store uh, memories, they, they are just recording the signals. Uh, that's the difference because your brain is able to do all of the stuff at once and you can do multiple things and even things that we are not able to achieve with current technology and we probably won't be anytime soon. <coughs> um, I think uh, this should be enough for the concept how our brain works and now we will move to current research. So, it might sound like a crazy idea. Who would want to store their brain? Uh, get your memories and store it digitally. Does anyone in the crowd? Can I do filtering? <laughs> <laughs> Probably, but um, it's a long way before we could even do that. There's a lot of research that is being done in different fields. Um, some of the most notable ones are 2045 initiative. This was uh, spearheaded by Russian entrepreneur and his initiative has a roadmap uh, that started in 2011 and is supposed to be done by 2045. Um, they were trying to create hologram-like humans, a replica of yourself in a hologram. Um, and they are behind the schedule right now. Uh, they missed two deadlines uh, for 2020 and 2025. Um, but there is other researchers which are doing research in different areas, small areas. Nectum is one of those startups uh, which is working into figuring out how our long-term memories are generated by our brain. Um, it's still a mystery. Uh, we d neuroscientists don't know where memories are stored um, in the neurons. Apparently, even if a single neuron is damaged, it will be in multiple other areas. You can still recall your memories. Um, it's basically, in computer terms, um, you store your database in backups. <laughs> your brain does that too, without you knowing it. So, how many of you watched Toy Story? Everyone did. So, in Toy Story, how, uh, when you're not observing, um, how the toys start living their lives. So, in 2022, the Nobel Prize was awarded to scientists who proved under quantum mechanics, apparently, the world we observe is not locally real. What does it mean? It means uh, definitive properties of an object, like color or uh, size, is not real until it is observed. So whatever we see might not be real. That's why every human brain perceives things differently. You might have seen in social media pictures of a dress that people see it in different colors. That's because our brain completes a lot of things for us. Um, that that uh, is a huge achievement in this figuring out how our brain works. Um, another really recent, like 10 days old <laughs> news is NVIDIA uh, launched their Omniverse platform in which you can create virtual world with real life physics like gravity, wind, and everything else. Um, it works exactly like how Earth works. It is being used right now by many industries um, to train their robots, so maybe 20 years from now, the world we see will be totally different. Um, right now, we have to like ask a question to AI to get an answer, maybe in the future. Um, you just think, and you'll have an answer. <laughs> you don't even have to ask, or type, or anything. Yes. Um, it, <laughs> uh, the question he asked is, uh, what, what does locally real mean? Um, and so there are two things, um, according to this research, the experiment that they performed is when you are observing a thing based on quantum, it, it's like a complicated <laughs> uh, topic. Um, it basically means until you observe 
that doesn't actually exist. So there might be an apple outside this room, but if nobody's watching, you don't know what it is. Uh, that's the whole concept of quantum mechanics. Um, uh, so is it possible to store human mind? So before we go on to find out if it is possible or not, let's see in current ChatGPT terms uh, how complex human brain is. Um, the human brain, each human brain has 86 billion neurons uh, with like thousands of connections between them. Um, so in total, there's like thousand trillion connections in human brain, each brain, compared with ChatGPT, which has 175 billion parameters, uh, which is similar to the neural connections it has, uh, neural weights. Um, so it's like thousand times less complex than human brain. So we are really far from it. <laughs> and size comparison. So our brain, one millimeter cube of our brain stores, uh, if you scan it for all the data it's in, um, it stores about 1.4 petabytes of data. Uh, if you have to store that much data in a data center, uh, you would need the size of 23 football fields of data center to store our brains. Um, so it, it needs, with current technology, it's really complex to even think about storing your brain. Um, so surprise, <laughs> it's not possible yet to store a human brain. It's not even possible to know how our brain processes uh, information, how it divides um, uh, our data into whatever we feel or observe in the world into memories. Um, it's not even possible to replicate any of our senses with current technology. Um, our eyes fills in a lot of details, which cameras don't do. That's why even if you have the most advanced camera, you can't get a picture of how you see it in real life. Um, some things that are possible right now um, are scientists were able to scan mouse's brain. <laughs> If you can see the picture there, mouse's brain is so tiny in compared to human brain, and it, is, uh, it doesn't have any folds in it. The more folds there are, the more connections there are in the brain, the more complex it is. Mouse's brain is the least complex brain. <laughs> um, and scientists are able to scan it for all the details in the mouse's brain, but they don't know. They cannot read the scans they produced. They cannot get actual information from it. Um, so yeah, we would need a lot more research and a lot more hybrid approach. With current classical computing, I don't think it is possible to store human brains as of today. <laughs> Maybe in 20 years or 30 years, um, but we'll see. But let's, Im let's imagine we have the technology. Are we ready in other aspects like ethics? So, for example, if we create, if we were able to create a replica of ourselves, um, and there are so many questions. Uh, there is this organization called Carbon Copies, which organizes uh, ethical questionnaire related to this topic every week. They have videos and they ask questions like, what would this replica have right in terms of rights? Um, Will it be able to give consent to be used? Uh, will people who consent to replicating their brain be able to give informed consent knowing what will their brain be used for in the future? Um, there is so many other uh, ethical questions. It might actually just exasperate the social inequalities we have today. Rich people might be able to <laughs> have this technology. And so we need to answer all these questions before this technology becomes reality, just like AI. Um, we didn't ask these questions when AI research was going on. And now, after now, uh, with it being as everyone can use it, and now we have deep fakes and all these problems which we haven't thought about before. So it would be really useful um, to think about it before we move forward in the research. And if you, if any of you in the audience have an ethical concern, 
please go to car carboncopies.org and raise your ethical concern there. And now we have some fun with storage space, uh, because if you somehow ethically obtain a sample of human brain, which is not that easy, you can just buy it online, uh, and uh, you would be able to scan it. Uh, the recent research that was published by Harvard with collaboration of Google researchers, uh, they scanned one cubic millimeter of human brain. Uh, they discovered some pretty interesting stuff, but since we are not, I, is there any neuroscientists here? No, okay. So, <laughs> so uh, we don't. We wouldn't be really uh, able to discover anything interesting. But the data is online. So if you are interested, they are encouraging people to go through the three D animation, and you can look for interesting stuff there. Uh, the little bit uh, interesting information for us is that they are saying that it takes one point four petabytes of data to store one cubic millimeter of human brain. If you take whole human brain, uh, you could just multiply the number, but it you have to say, and since we are software engineers, that this is pretty inefficient storage because it's just images from electron microscopes. Uh, so if you would compare it to like bitmaps and vector storage, uh, that's in future we will have to find some way to compress the data and the way we will uh, we will do the brain scanning. Uh, but we have we can have fun with the 1.4 petabytes number. Uh, we will show you how exactly big the number is. Um, and uh, yeah, because I think we can. Yeah, I can switch it. Yeah, so you have 1.4 petabytes, um, and as I said, uh, take it with some some grain of salt because uh, we, if we if we multiply it, some of your F brains are around like 1,040 uh, 1,400 uh, cubic milli uh, centimeters, which is like way more. If you multiply this 1.4 petabytes, it would be too much. Um, so uh, if we take the biggest USB stick or the biggest SSD disk we have right now, uh, it would be 700 of those USB sticks. You wouldn't be able to fit them in the pocket. So if, if you were thinking about gifting your brain map to someone, uh, you wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, or it would be have to be a pretty big gift box. Uh, if you take 14 pieces uh, of the 100 terabyte disk, that's a little bit better, but you would still have to think about how would you connect them and how would you make sense of the scan. Uh, since we are here in Czechia, we have around 10 million people here. So if you multiply the number uh, and you would somehow, let's say at birth, we would collect one, one cubic millimeter of each of your brains uh, and we would want to store them uh, in the same resolution they did in the research, it would still be too much. It would be 14 zettabytes, which is 14 billion terabytes. Uh, and just to put it into perspective, um, well, let's say the, in 2022, the whole internet traffic by Cisco was around four to five zettabytes. Uh, so, and that was whole internet traffic. So even our small country wouldn't be able to, uh, get, to just store samples from all of people we have here. Um, if you are a fan of cat videos, to put it into perspective, it's seven million hours of HD video and you would be able to watch cat videos for 800 years. Uh, so <laughs> uh, that's how big the number is. Uh, and that's just one cubic millimeter of the human human brain. Um, since we are thinking about pricing, there has to be some future pricing model. Uh, because if we would have some application and we would be able to somehow uh, store the data and you would be crazy enough to upload it into cloud, uh, we, we are even thinking about security measures. Uh, but if you would be crazy enough, like raise your hands if you would try it. Yeah. I. All right, there's one person there. <laughs> um, uh, but we would have to somehow make money off of it, right? Uh, so this is just uh, just fun uh, fun slide to somehow capture how we could actually differentiate between between the the storage. You, we would have, of course, have to differentiate based on the memories, uh, based on the access to the memories, because you want you want to relive your happiest memories, right? So we, we have to give you that option, but it won't be free. Uh, yeah, and I, I just for the fun of it, if you take the 1.4 petabytes and you can you can go to Amazon price models or any other service, uh, then uh, you can you can choose from their pricing model. And <coughs> if you choose something that you are not dependent on the retrieval time, uh, you get pretty sane number. Maybe you would even be able to pay for it, but it still would be just only small, uh, small, um, 
small uh, part of your brain that you would be able to store there. And now since we have so many storage, what will we do with our environment? Uh, I guess we will... Okay, uh, before we talk about how much our brain would need, um, this is ChatGPT 3.5, which is 1,000 times less complex than human brain. Um, it uses the supercomputer that ChatGPT 3.5 was trained on, has 285,000 CPUs and 10,000 GPUs with 400 gigabytes of per second connectivity. And all the energy it was taking, the GPUs, all the energy it takes, 99% of it turns into heat. Imagine the greenhouse emissions. Um, and how much water you would need to cool all that heat and manage it. All the electrical waste, electronic waste, as if it's not enough what we have today, <laughs> um, just from replicate, being able to replicate one brain with current co computing technology, it is going to be dystopian. <laughs> um, so there should be a, an approach. We, we should think about all these environmental concerns and figure out a way to either advance hardware to not use so much um, to g is get the same operational capacity of our brain. Um, although we don't know, we run like billions of um, operations. Our brain runs bi billions of operations every second. Everything in your body is running because of your brain. <laughs> and um, ChatGPT even doesn't do that <laughs> for a second. Um, and other concerns would be like overpopulation on Earth. There may be overpopulation on cloud. <laughs> um, and in, in terms of perspective, one human brain would use per day 2% of global energy usage if we are able to store human brain into cloud and it produces 4% of global greenhouse emissions today. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> That's only one brain. Um, yeah, so are we doomed? Um, no, uh, not yet. Uh, hopefully, uh, the, at least the big companies, what we, what we see from the research, they are moving towards more renewable energy. Uh, the big companies like uh, Amazon, Apple, etc., they are moving uh, to our solar and wind energy. Uh, so you can you can check the report; it's it's pretty interesting. But uh, I think we are not there yet. Uh, but we we still have lots of work to do. And since we are comparing to ChatGPT, we asked ChatGPT how one of his queries uh, how much cons uh, con energy it consumes. Uh, so. It's it apparently if you do some complex query, uh, it's equi equivalent to once or twice charging your smartphone. Um, so and imagine it's not just me asking, and it's like ten thousand or more people asking. I'm still underestimating the number, but um, if you just multiply it, it's it's crazy to imagine that it takes so much energy. Uh, it's really hard to give the estimates. Uh, I don't know. I did did a little bit of fact checking about this answer, uh, but the companies they don't really publish such data. They uh, they usually publish just the consumption they do monthly or yearly. So you can't really now know what what consum what consumption what consumption they have. Uh, but hopefully hopefully uh, there's uh, light on the horizon and <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we are not doomed yet with the environment. Um, and let's see what would you do if you can create a digital clone of your brain. Um, I don't know, we have like five minutes left, right? Yeah, so I don't think we can really wait for the answers. Uh, maybe let's wait like to, we can we can back up to it, yeah. Uh, let's, let's end it on high note with, with potential advantages. While you think about what you would do with this technology, let me tell you what the world can be if this technology becomes real. Um, doctors will be able to actually do brain transplants, maybe, if they figure out how brains actually work. Um, that's the only organ which cannot be transplanted in today's world uh, yet. Um, they will be able to perform simulation uh, operations even before you would have to do it on real person. 
we don't even have to get to the point where we are able to store our brains um, even before that. If we go in the right direction, uh, we can use it for, um, you can just simulate your brain, like you can connect your brain to a computer and you can learn any skill in the world. You can read all the books in the world um, and we can store our cultural uh, knowledge in a better way in cloud instead of depending on historians to tell us the correct information. Um, and just to in the process of figuring out our brain, we may be able to figure out what consciousness is actually and how the universe works. And we can create simulations before passing laws to know how different people will react to stuff and considering everything else that's happening in the world. <laughs> um, let's go back and see what you all will do if this technology is real. I don't see any answers. Oh, oh I guess. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it, it doesn't record um, oh, bring okay. the mic. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm a neuroscientist. I'm just wondering, okay, so I think you might have overestimated the storage uh, demand of a human brain because that, uh, that 86 billion neuron, only part of it will be responsible for memory formation, um, transforming working memory, short-term memory to long-term memory. And also, like, a lot of the brain area responsible for vision, for your maybe regulating your blood pressure, your respiration. We don't need to store that in a whatever backup oh. facility, right? So. Um, let me clarify uh, part of what we said, one millimeter cube, uh, you would need 1.4 petabytes of data. That was just to scan the different parts of brain, <laughs> uh, the different neurons. Scientists aren't able to read it yet. And it is not actual memories that are scanned in that much data, um, but yeah. You're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Watch every anime. Some cool stuff. Replay dreams. Yeah, that is really interesting. That would be really interesting to replay your dreams <laughs> and be able to store that while you're asleep. We'll force it to write code instead of me. <laughs> But at the end of the presentation, and the slides are attached to the schedule, uh, you can actually uh, you can actually see the sources we used, and there are also sources like if you ever think about donating your brain to research purposes, you can sign up. Uh, <laughs> and of course, it's after you die. It's like it, they wouldn't take the sample <laughs> while you live. Uh, but it's like you know we we need the brain to understand it more. So you have to so you have someone has to do like, collect the yeah. samples. Uh, so if, if you are interested, like you can you can sign up for that. Um, yeah, these are these are the sites where you can actually get involved. Um, yeah, as a developer, you can submit your ethical concerns or like other other interesting stuff, and then try and sign up for brain donation. Uh, they apparently don't accept every brain, so you have to be <laughs> you have to be lucky to actually get into uh, into the uh, trial. Usually, they are interested in in the brains that are suffering from some uh, special disease like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Uh, but I guess you can sign up and you will see yourself. Um, yeah, and these are the this is the slide with questions, but I think there are not any questions there because yeah, and we are up to time. I think five minutes left. Oh, we have five minutes. So do we have any questions here? There's one. Um, I will repeat the question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 yeah, 
Yeah, I definitely think there needs to be it. Okay, the question was um, if did people think the, about the opposite side to use to to use your neurons to store Facebook data or something like that? That would be really efficient. And I think with quantum computing or quantum mechanics, that's the way the research is going. Quantum mechanics is basically trying to replicate how our brains or the universe works. Um, if we get advanced in advancement into quantum mechanics and actually figuring out how ne you know neurons are cannot be recreated, right? <laughs> yeah, that that's like one of the part that cannot be recreated even by our body. So there needs to be some research, re a lot of research to figure out. Yeah. <laughs> um. But still, somewhere around the world, there seems to be someone making next breakthrough. Yes. Yeah, I think the first step is for us all to work together to even go towards that point and to be able to use it for good good uses. <laughs> um, thank you. So oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the thing, that, that's what I was trying to say is with current computational uh, te technology we have, it's probably going to take a lot of energy and emit a lot of energy. So it would be amazing if neuroscientists could work with technologies or technologists or technologists could work with neuroscientists and come up with an approach that doesn't use so much hardware. We, we have come a long way since 50s. <laughs> um, hopefully, if we figure out how our brain works, we can replicate it with technology and not use that much energy. But you don't have to even think about it has to be technology we have right now. Because like the, if, you if you are stuck on current technology, you, can't, you, you are not able to figure out like energy solution that would be suitable for our time. So, you know, maybe we will just have some kind of hybrid technology organoid structure that will just capture the, the memories outside of your brain. So you can't really think in in sense of current technology. You have to think about what it, what will happen in future and like how we can combine the knowledge. Uh, well, the scan, the one uh, one uh, cubic millimeter, uh, it's uh, all from all of the layers of the brain. They they obtained the sample from one of the sick persons throughout the. Uh, it was ethically obtained. Don't worry. And, <laughs> uh, and they scanned basically all the layers uh, the neurons have. So in each layer, there's different neurons. I think our neuroscientists can keep us right. <laughs> yeah. yeah.
Um, we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us.